welcome. Um, the Encouraging Nature in Your Own Backyard, backyard series. Um, this is the final part of that series tonight. Um, is being co-hosted by the Penfield and Pittsford Libraries in collaboration with Color Penfield Green and Color Pittsford Green. My name is Robin Avery. I am the Programming and Outreach Librarian at the Pittsford Community Library, and I'm joined in co-hosting tonight the, um, and this series by Peggy O'Neill, Programming Librarian at the Penfield Public Library. Tonight we're hearing from a Frog House founder, Margot Fass. Margot is an activist, artist, author, educator, and presenter who is passionate about amphibians and nature. Uh, before we get started tonight, um, we have a couple of guidelines just to ensure that we all have a good experience. Uh, we have a rather large audience tonight, so please make sure you're muted and your video is off. We also ask that you put any and all questions in the chat. Peggy and I will facilitate a period of question and answer from the chat at the end of the program. Um, before we dive in tonight to tonight's lecture, Megan Mayer, of Color Penfield Green and Mary Moore of Color Pittsford Green will give some information about their organizations and we'll touch on what practices our communities are currently engaging in. Thank you very much, Robin and Peggy for um, hosting this, this series. And uh, thank you all for coming tonight. And for those of you who have been in all of our series, um, apologies for going through this again, but we do want to recognize um, some of the um, organizations that have really um, helped to pull this together. Um, so tonight, um, we hope to inspire you again to, um, since spring is on the way, um, to rethink your yard, your gardens, to make it more inviting for yourself, as well as to increase its potential to support the many species we depend on for a healthy ecosystem that supports us. Color Penfield Green is an organization of Penfield residents concerned about our environment, and their goals are to inform fellow residents about all the incredible ways our community is going green with a focus on reducing our carbon footprint and taking action on ways that we can protect nature um, and our biodiversity. Um, they also educate our residents on ways our community can embrace and take action on sustainable life practices that reduce, again, that carbon footprint, enhance our yards and town land that will support those ecosystems that support us. Healthy Yards, Penfield um, and Pittsford is a new initiative, Penfield through Color Penfield Green. Um, and this nature series will give you um, some new ways to enhance your yard tonight for our um, for um, our amphibians, our frogs, and hopefully some toads, because I have toads in my yard. <laughs> Color Penfield Green, Color Pittsford Green, are Pittsford residents who have come together with similar goals to inform, encourage, and assist the town and residents to take actions on our climate crisis through local changes. Ideas include reducing the local carbon footprint by converting to renewable electricity, increasing energy efficiency, reducing food waste, adopting community-wide composting, and creating healthy landscapes for humans and wildlife. Mary Moore and I teamed up to bring our two towns together through this nature series and I would like to introduce Mary, um, who will talk about her town of Pittsburgh's progress towards a healthy environment. Thank you, Megan. Hi, everyone. I'm Mary Moore. Uh, Megan and I live in different towns, but we share the same goals for Pittsburgh and Penfield and the people who live there. We promote healthy habitats that provide food and nesting areas for insects and birds. Healthy habitats require the planting of native trees, shrubs and flowers, and you know, pesticides. In 2018, I stood before the Pittsburgh Town Board and requested that the town stop applying pesticides 
to town properties. In preparing for this request, I discovered that we in New York have some protection from pesticide health hazards. The Child Safe Playing Fields Act of 2010 prohibits the application of pesticides to any playgrounds, turf, athletic fields, or playing fields on school or daycare properties in the state of New York. Governor Cuomo recently signed a law that prohibits the use of the pesticide glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, on all New York state property effective December 31st of this year, 2021. Our birds and insects have no policies or, or laws to protect them from pesticides. Pesticide use is one of the leading causes in the steep decline of birds, bees, butterflies, and other beneficial insects. Let's go back to Pittsford's progress toward a pesticide-free town. With the help of concerned residents, the town established the Toxic Free Challenge program to encourage residents to maintain pesticide-free lawns. Spencer Bernard will explain more about the challenge. Hi, my name is Spencer Bernard, Chief of Staff for the Town of Pittsburgh. I'm here to talk about one of my favorite sustainability initiatives, the Pittsburgh Toxic-Free Challenge. For decades, the town practices Oh, thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Spencer Bernard, Chief of Staff for the Town of Pittsburgh. I'm here to talk about one of my favorite sustainability initiatives, the Pittsburgh Toxic Free Challenge. For decades, the town practice has been to use as little pesticides as possible and to only treat severe or safety issues. In fact, the town maintains 3,100 acres of land using less chemical herbicides and pesticides each year than two, just two average half acre yards in Pittsburgh used with a chemical lawn service. That's what got us to turn our attention to the tidal wave of pesticides being used on private residences. Committing to a toxic free lawn is where the most change can be made. So working with engaged citizens, we supported a grassroots movement that shows you can have a toxic free lawn that is healthy, looks great, and is good for people, plants, and animals. Maintaining a toxic free lawn that is good for the environment and looks good is not too hard. Some simple steps that can make a big impact include choose the right grass for your yard conditions. Consider replacing some lawn with native trees, shrubs, and flowers. Native plants need very little watering, very little care, and no chemicals. Mow and water correctly, patch bare spots quickly to avoid weeds, and reevaluate your lawn contract to avoid non-organic pesticides and herbicides. You'll find more information and tips on maintaining a good looking lawn without chemicals on the town website at townofpittsford.org forward slash toxic free. If you're committed to a toxic free lawn like I am, you can show your support with one of our toxic free challenge lawn signs. You can pick one up at the town hall front steps or at a community garden at Thornell Farm Park. I hope you'll consider helping us create a greener, healthier, more sustainable community. Every little bit helps. Many thanks to the engaged residents who worked with the town to plan the toxic free challenge and make it a reality. And a special thanks to all of you involved in this discussion. Your efforts will help educate our community and will lead to a more sustainable future for us all. The town of Pittsburgh continues to use a limited amount of pesticides. However, significant strides have been made towards zero use. In March 2019, Pittsburgh hired a pesticide-free contractor to maintain neighborhood districts and other town properties. This decision cut back on the use of Cleanup Pro, a fully loaded glyphosate formulation. New machinery was purchased to make pesticide elimination more successful. An aerator for compacted soil, an overseeder to fill in bare spots where weeds may grow. In conclusion, we continue to lobby the town to adopt a pesticide-free policy in alignment with the Child Safe Plain Fields Act. And a little addition tonight, 
um, my Facebook page, Pesticide Free Pittsburgh, has been renamed. It's called Healthy Yards for Penfield and Pittsburgh. It's a collaborative effort by Megan and me with a more holistic slant on biodiversity. Thanks. And um, for those of you who have been through this series, um, and you might have checked this out already, um, this is um, a wonderful um, uh, website uh, put together by Doug Tallamy. Um, it's a collaborative conservation project called Homegrown National Park, um, which is a call to action. And its purpose is to create an urban suburban beltway for pollinators uh, by planting native plants in your yard. And um, those native plants in turn provide the food source for our birds in spring and also our frogs. Mary and I envision growing our own homegrown national park um, through our two towns and beyond. So if any of you are interested, feel free to connect with both Mary or myself, and we will put those um, links in the chat. Thanks very much. Great. And now we will hear from Margo, if you want to get ready to She might uh yes to unmute maybe. Let's see. Yeah. I mean she was muted. Okay, let's see. Nope. I thought I pressed it here. Let me see. Hmm. Yep, I just saw um Margo, I just saw you unmute. So if you're yeah. she okay, good. Yeah. Getting ready. Bear with us folks for just a couple minutes while we're getting ready. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay, great. Awesome. All right, wonderful. So, onward. Mm -hmm. Imagine for a moment a woman absolutely nuts about frogs. She considers herself a frog whisperer because a frog sat on her arm, jumped on her arm, and sat there for about 45 minutes. She is also a frogophile, and that is a collage, which was going to be made into a painting, but I've made dozens and dozens and dozens of paintings of frogs. But I also can't keep out of a garden. And um, so knowing that a frog can die within an hour if you spray it with atrazine or glyco glyphosate, I've had a vision. She, that woman's me, you didn't guess. I've had a vision since uh, 65 State Street came into our life for the whole village and town of Pittsburgh to become a model community that doesn't use uh, chemicals. I've worked for 40 years as a psychiatrist and I'm still working to support my husband and my frog interests. This world of activism, connecting with like-minded folks environmentalism, politics, sustainability, and how much it all costs in time, in terms of time and money is all new to me. Margo? Yes. Sorry, just for a second. Um, we can't see your video or your screen. Yeah. You can't see my screen? No. No. Oh, <laughs> well, let me go back. <laughs> yeah. And somebody has to make, uh, let me see. Yes, you should be a co-host. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you interrupted me. <laughs> oh, that would have been silly. Um, usually I see a place to 
Do you see a green share screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, now I'll get it. Yeah. And then uh, I'll share the screen. Mm -hmm. Start the video. Okay, share the screen. You can see the share, share thing, right? We can see your video. We can see you. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Yeah, good. There we go. Yeah. All right, now. Um, I'm going to do present. I told you, uh, Robin, that I I knew all about this, but <laughs> <laughs> it's the joys of you, right? We're all yeah. learning. <laughs> okay, let's start again, shall we? All right. <laughs> now, on my oh, there we go. Okay. Damn. I just see a white screen. Do you have it's a just white? Yeah. Somebody's got, but uh, there's a little frog here that keeps jumping on my button and pushing it ahead. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> okay, so we were imagining this woman who's nuts about frogs, and uh, she's a frog whisperer, and she's an artist, and she uh, uh, also is a gardener, but an amateur gardener. And um, so I've had these big green dreams since um, since uh, Lindsay moved to town to try to make a frog house a model. I mean, a frog house, the village of Pittsburgh, a model community. Margo, we still can't see your your yeah. screen. We're we're only seeing a white screen. Right. So maybe if you go to yeah. share screen. Yeah, it says I'm, that my screen, oh, it says I'm uh, sharing my screen, but uh, okay, resume the share. I think you need to choose, um, there are a couple of choices. One is to share PowerPoint or. Yeah. You don't want me to share my screen. Um, were you you were working with a PowerPoint? Yeah. Do you it have like uh, I have power to admit Jim Falvo? It's very strange. Yeah. So when you click on the share screen at the bottom, yeah, um, it should show a couple of windows that are options. Okay, so uh, this Google Google Chrome probably. Yeah, whichever one has your presentation in it. Yeah, okay, share. Yeah. Okay, can you see it now? Yes. 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 Yeah, good. Great. There we go. Mm -hmm. That's great. Okay, everybody's trying to... <laughs> I'll just tell you a little story. Mm -hmm. When I had a show at the Unitarian Church, I was putting paint on the, on the item at the last minute. And, uh, and then took it over the church wet. So as you can see, I have ADD and I'm an amateur and I fly by the seat of my pants. <laughs> and I'm 80 years old. So let's start again. <laughs> Did you want to see my title slide? Uh, I, can't change, I can't change my slides. I don't have the power to. Um. If you click on the screen, I've, I've seen this problem before. If you click on the screen, it should, yeah. There How do go. I go backwards? You can use your arrow keys now. Now I can use it. Yeah. All right. Robin, you're a genius. <laughs> Robin's good. She's good. <laughs> All right. Here we go. All right. So what I was saying is that, uh, that I am a frogophile. I am a frog whisperer, I wish, but I have had a few frogs jump on me and uh, I like to garden. Mm -hmm. Okay, I know that uh, atrazate and glyphosate are very horrible for frog and other living beings. And so I have tried um, since going to meetings at the village board to, uh, to work as much as possible as to say that Pittsburgh really ought to be a model community. It doesn't use pit, uh, chemicals. And then fortunately I ran up uh, uh, and met 
uh, Mary Moore, who has been spearheading this for much longer than I have. <laughs> and uh, so I'm so glad we're all on the same page. <laughs> Anyway, I've been a psychiatrist for 40 years and I still have to work because I have to um, support my husband and support my frog habit. I am completely new to the world of activism and connecting with other people, environmentalism, politics, sustainability, and how much it all costs. So for the first three years, we have self-funded uh, these efforts. And uh, this year we have, um, incorporated as a 501c3. So every minute and penny I've spent has been very, very worthwhile, but I do um, need more time and money to move on. So if anybody wants to volunteer or donate to the cause, it's a froghouse.org. And, um, and uh, if you don't want to do that, then please, I hope you're inspired to get active in your own backyard. As Megan says, <laughs> you need a corridor. I just learned about corridors through Megan. Mm -hmm. And my arrows are not working. Let's see. Touch the space bar, touch the, Yeah. Try put click. my mouse on the screen. Yeah. All right. There we go. Now, uh, this is a little bit um, controversial because of um, a phrase that is in there, but, I just wanted to let you know that the, the rackety coon child is uh, what well, Kelly's diminutive for a toddler raccoon. The point of the slide, however, is that not everyone agrees about the wonders of rugs. Totally freaked out was very upset that the former owners of her house had actually encouraged creatures like toads and bats to live in their garden because they are endangered. They made shelters for them and never used poisons. Totally freaked out, did not wish to hurt the frogs, but she wanted them to leave. And she asked Miss Floribunda, who is shown in all her full glory in the upper right-hand corner, if there was a humane way to encourage them to leave. Fortunately, Mrs. Floribunda did not agree with Totally, and she suggested that she learn to live and appreciate e amphibians. She pointed out that frogs are very important in our ecosystems. Just like birds and bats and insects, frogs are disappearing. And I do believe that where frogs can survive, life can survive. Sustainable principles apply to all life. We just need to apply them. One of every three amphibian species are threatened with an extinction. I think I'll go back to that slide there. And they may not survive the 21st century. 200 amphibians uh, species have already gone extinct in the last 20 years. Normally we lose one or two species every 500 years. So this is really precipitous. This is a worldwide problem due to a large extent of the chytrid fungus. And you may know of the white nose syndrome in bats that is um, the order of Scheriptera, whereas frogs are the order of Anura. But anyway, that disease, which was written about um, in the New Yorker in 2008, I think, uh, when I first got interested in all of this is just decimating both of those uh, orders. So sp humans spread these diseases. And even though uh, frogs don't eat plants, some of them are toxic to them uh, by touch. And fortunately, most of our New York species are doing all right. Anyway, I wanted to tell you about this cool toad that was thought to be extinct for a thousand years. And it was actually discovered again in 1980. This male, this is a male, winds the this, this string of pearl-like eggs that the, that the female lays and carries it on its back until they hatch into frog poles, tadpoles. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, there are many wonders about frogs if you, if you wanna get into it, but I mean, just, that fact that the, the frog does that and carries them around, how could you kill a toad like that? Mm. 
our ancestors, uh, the amphibian ancestors, were before dinosaurs and way before mm -hmm. human beings. They've survived all kinds of uh, natural disasters and uh, the fiercest of ele elements, including those that are coming up. And so they'll probably outlive us. This is a cricket frog and it's common in southeastern New York State, no, although not up here in our area. And that little fellow is probably about uh, half an inch long. Mm -hmm. Threats to frogs are very similar to the threats to plants, bats, birds, and insects, and life itself. These are the common threats to frogs and all other life, which you're well familiar with, and uh, they've already been talked about in terms of the birds and the bees. So uh, we just, we have to take action right away as soon as possible. Her, humans are the worst threat to all life on earth, not, not by, by not allowing nature just to be nature. We've wiped out 60% of animal life in 52 years. We ruin the air, water, line, land, climate, flora, and fauna at breakneck speed. Now, Ms. Floribunda pointed out to totally freaked out uh, that uh, frogs are very good because they eat ticks and other insects. And uh, also they are a keystone species, meaning that if frogs disappeared, the whole ecosystem above them and below them would collapse. If frogs go, we go, and we had better pay attention. I just read this morning that oceans are a tipping point and that vast numbers of rivers are turning from blue to green or even yellow. Mm -hmm. More needs to be learned about this. So uh, it doesn't sound encouraging for frogs. Here's a cool fact that, um, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> My husband loves to interrupt me, especially five minutes before we start. Now he's trying to get the dog who is being perfectly quiet. I apologize. Um, it's my ADD amateurism. Excuses, excuses. Okay, so this, uh, where were we? We were at this little uh, cool frog. And um, the biggest living frog is the American Goliath frog, and that's 12 inches long. And in 2008, they found a fossil of what was called the giant frog from hell. And that frog lived about 70 million years ago. It was 16 inches long. So, so far, we don't know about any frogs bigger than 16 inches, but you can imagine if it's about this big, that's a pretty big frog indeed. And Maybe it being extinct proves that violence does not pay off eventually. So, oh, okay. uh, uh, but even in the worst of times, we have to have hope. Uh, I can't move forward or back. What do I do? Touch the screen. So what are we here? Um, as I said, um, we're in pretty good shape and an ounce of pre prevention is worth a pound of cure. So here is, I just said something kind of trite, but uh, I thought I'd introduce a bit of rhyme to tell you about our four native frogs. So in March, and this is in order of appearance during our, our spring. In March, it is such a lovely thing to hear the wood frog start to sing. And the peeper, harbinger of spring, takes away the winter's sting. The American toad brings some fear in April, and then three more frogs appear. Frogs, gray tree, green, and leopard deer, their varied sound we hope to hear. I hope this literary friend of mine is not listening because she would have a fit over this rhyme. <laughs> anyway, toads and bullfrogs get bad raps, but hating life is just a trap. 
as Mr. Bullfrog awakens from his nap, it's May, a time for all to clap. Poor American bullfrog, native to the Eastern United States, kids use them for sport, pinging them with BB guns. Adults harvest them for food and have exported them all over the world, although the US is a net importer of frogs. Uh, this has uh, led to a huge um, increase in diseases and uh, destruction of native, native species. So our daughter, Lindsay, moved from North Carolina in 2017 to be closer to us and found an amazing renovated house with a backyard structure and a garage to rent on the canal in Pittsburgh. It couldn't be a better location, but I couldn't stand the bareness of the landscape. The poison lawn and beds covered with dyed mulch looked horrible. When Lindsay told the landlord she didn't want maintenance, including chemicals, the landlord said she would have to take care of it herself. Well, who's gonna do that but mom? So abandoning my artwork and uh, our own home, I set to work. The first way to save frogs, of course, is to use only organic materials and never any pesticides or other harmful chemicals. This is taken through the screen, which is why there was all that mesh. All right, so um, the landlord had, uh, the maintenance person had put in some plantings and uh, especially around the three structures. Mm. Peonies, sage, daylilies, hydrangea. We added instant beauty with hanging baskets from gallias, but those turned to, out to be too much work because it's very hard for me to water from the city where I live. Mm -hmm. We had no idea what happened to the hapless hedge, but adding a lattice fence and perennials helped. At the time, I only knew about using organic materials and not that much about native plants versus invasives and cultivars, attracting the birds and the bees. And I wasn't actually even thinking about frogs just then. Then Bunny, whom you might've seen in the above photo on the bottom right corner, became a resident. At first she lived behind some old fencing by the garage and kindled some kittens, which in the vernacular means uh, she gave birth to some baby bunnies. Then she moved to live first under the hedge, now protected with lattice. There may have been too much activity for her when the neighbors put up a six foot high fence and cut off five feet of her hedge. So she moved under Lindsay's back porch. Mm. Sometimes she peers over the steps to ask for a carrot, but she loves the, carrot, the clover dandelions and dandelion leaves in the summer and spring. Ginger was a busy little lady. She enjoyed the thickening grass and was perfectly comfortable coming up to the porch to explore a jam jar. Sadly, either a neighbor's cat or my, more likely their neighbor's BB gun killed her. Lindsay was absolutely heartbroken. I would like to say a word about cats. Um, according to the American Bird Conservatory, predation by domestic cats is the number one direct human cause threat to birds in the United States and Canada, and outdoor cats kill approximately 2.4 billion birds every year. Mm -hmm. That may seem unbelievable, but it re represents the combined impact of tens of millions of cats. Mm -hmm. They also eat bats and frogs. So I, uh, although belling a cat is a good idea, it didn't stop a neighbor cat from getting a baby rabbit in our neighborhood and we had worked mm -hmm so hard eliminating pesticides to invite the rabbits back here uh, that when I saw that little baby rabbit going by in the cat's mouth, it was really upsetting. And true, uh, they have no other natural predators, but please, if you have outdoor cats, I'm, I'm asking you. And I'd like to make one other digression about meanness. Um, some of us are old enough to remember that uh, song from South Pacific, Remember, you've got to be taught to hate and fear, to hate all the people near and dear. Uh, anyway, you've got to be carefully taught. So uh, another thing a frog house is working on is compassion and understanding 
and uh, and um, being nice to other people because uh, I don't think that the politics of of uh, smearing people go down very well. So back to our topic. Okay, so the West Bank here on the left has been had been pre-planted by uh, the boxwood and by this olive plant um, that has been growing like a weed. I had put in some of the annuals that year and some of them actually were biannuals and came back. And petunias, by the way, are very, very good for frogs. Um, so uh, on the right uh, bank, there were a whole lot of uh, invasive plants, including mugwort, phragmites, common reeds, and garlic mustard, which are prone to grow, grow along the side of the canal. So um, we wanted to take them all out because it was just a big mess. And if we didn't take them out and have a garden, the, the uh, Erie Canal Preserve will come along and mow it all down. But um, in any case, these are the same kinds of invasives that are uh, have to be taken out of the town nature preserve in the future village arboretum. So we bought some st stones and most of these plants I brought from my own garden in the city. Sorry for the pointer. So once mama had gardened her way all around the property, it was time to address what to do about that little outlying house, which is 10 feet by 10 feet. It was very cute, but in serious disrepair with missing ceiling plaster and rotting door and window sills. We took down one set of shelves and left the built-ins. We fixed up the inside of the structure, painted the walls, ceiling trim, cabinets, and shelves. Mm -hmm. In one sense, we already had dozens of frogs in our backyard represented in painting, informational material, frogabilia, and our frogophiles. These were the uh, people who came to our first open house in October of 2018. About the same time as the opening, I wrote about inviting frogs in the frog blog um, by having frog ponds. It was just so easy to do. Just put shallow dishes around filled with water, surround them by old decaying logs and put in a ceramic toad house, a garden pot on its side or big some, build some rocks shelves. These are probably very safe. So we did take them down. I was afraid in the winter if a toad went in there or a frog, they might get squished. Um, let me go back if I can. Yeah. There's supposed to be another frog. So um, in the beginning, box elder beetles swarmed all over the leaning box elder shown here, the ground around it and the frog itself inside and out. I never touched them and I certainly didn't spray them. Mayor Rob Corby had counseled us for a long time that we needed to take this uh, box elder down before it uh, crushed either the house or caused more damage in the neighbor's greenhouse from broken limbs. The amazing thing is that especially without pesticides, the beetles disappeared after I prepared this little frog area under the box elder tree. Patty Love of bare Barefoot Permaculture explained to me this past summer that when a tree is stressed, it puts out a sap that attracts the beetles, almost like a suicide uh, cry for help. When the tree is fed and watered without the stress of chemicals and therefore much happier, the sap disappears and the beetles have nothing left to live on. Sadly, I went through all that summer without seeing frogs in our backyard. At least Lindsay's friend had given her this fountain for the property. It makes a pleasant bubbling noise and attracts birds and chipmunks, but it doesn't beat the sound of frogs. Even more sadly, we had a visitor who was so afraid of frogs that she couldn't even look at the sculpture. She was a loving woman, but some atavistic aversion that even a frog figure triggered a fear um, reaction 
must have been taught to her in childhood or perhaps passed on by generations. But there were other delights for the visitor to focus on, such as meeting fellow frogophiles. That summer, someone stopped by who really had known what to do with her property. Her website shows how she and her kids dug this um, ground, put in plastic sheeting, let the pond fill with water, and added lily pads. The next summer, the family was rewarded with eggs, tadpoles and froglets, and frogs. Now, here's a quiz time. Does anyone remember, and you can't share your screen or unmute, but do you remember the common name of this frog? Here is a hint, it changes color. So the first one you saw over here is gray or sort of brownish gray. And this one is green. And it goes peep, peep, peep. So it's a spring peeper, right? I hope you've seen spring peepers and heard them. Now, um, I think we skipped a few slides by mistake, but uh, uh, this is one of the, my friend's frogs. And um, so is it a green frog or a bull, uh, a, yeah, an American bullfrog? Remember I told you about the American bullfrog that, uh, that is invasive. And this one has a dorsal uh, lateral ridges and it has a very large tympanum. So in plural, it's called tympana. So this is actually a green frog. So first of all, we want to do good and not harm, and we want to leave frogs alone. So this was the problem with the with this land. And uh, they're all from the same yard. Whoops. Unfortunately, the owner sold her house. Ironically, the buyer of this house called me to ask exactly the same thing that totally uh, freaked out, asked Miss Floribunda. She said she hated frogs. She didn't want them. She didn't want to hurt them. And couldn't I just go scoop some out for them and take them someplace else? So um, I thought I'd better consult with Carrie Krieger, who is my mentor and, and the founder of Save the Frogs. So we got into a three-way uh, conversation about the illegality of moving frogs more than over one mile. Sandra Frankel told me yesterday that uh, about how they move frogs at the U of R, but they just built a, a water site very close by and the frogs hopped over so that the U of R could use the, the land in another way. But again, as I mentioned, transported frogs can carry or, or catch disease and they can be either eat or eat, be eaten by native species. They should never be released on a nature reserve or a public um, um, place without consent and they require a license. In an unauthorized place, take warning, you could be liable for prosecution under the Abandonment of Animals Act 1960s. So you may know that some people will buy frogs as pets. So please don't do that. But then they get tired of them and they release them and the same problems ensue. So um, you need in Pittsburgh and probably other towns to have a permit. So if you're thinking of doing such a thing, unless you're putting just little shallow dishes out, uh, you will need a permit. Okay, next thing we can do. Animal rights activists are sickened that frogs' back legs are cut off while the animals are still alive and their living bodies are just tossed aside. The numbers of frogs killed each other in their living bodies, I mean, is estimated conservatively to about 3.2 billion frogs or about 500,000 tons of frog legs. If an average person weighs 135, you can figure out how many tons of persons that represents. Besides the food 
trade being a threat to frogs' existence, they carry diseases and they make it, uh, not only animals, but humans sick as well. California issued permits to over 2,000 live frog, bullfrogs to be brought into the state for food from China, Japan, and Southeast Asia. Even the American bullfrog has made its way over to those countries. Then they escape or they're freed by well meaning humans. And again, they eat native amphibians and compete for them for habitat and food. So this was at the end of 2019. Poor mama. Now you may recognize, however, those little blue signs that uh, Bernard waved around in the, the beginning. And uh, I hope everyone is tempted um, by the first three webinars and, uh, and today to go and get a sign from uh, Spencer Bernard, or is it Bernard Spencer? But in any case, uh, to get one of these signs and uh, go chemical free. This geranium on the left is my pride and joy because it was, uh, it just came up this summer. And uh, please ignore the portulaca because it's not native, but uh, someone gave it to me for free and it needs very little um, the water. But the great thing about this geranium is that and we've made a garden uh, garage where we've put ferns and things like that. And this uh, geranium is uh, still blooming all winter long. Having just gotten up our, given up our quest this year, what to our wondering eyes should appear, but a marvelous frog for our happy sphere in our very own backyard right here. That was on September 24th. It should be noted that Lindsay decided right about that time to buy 65 State Street. So we are now co-owners of that property. Frogs, it was, frogs are definitely my spiritual totem. And I think, of, as a lot of other people do think that they bring uh, good luck. And their very name, frog, is an acronym for fully rely on God, which is my favorite mantra. And I said several times before this started <laughs> because of various catastrophes that happened before it did. But anyway, no matter how evil things might look, even our trials are turned to good for those who are called to higher purposes. So this is Dwight. And if you look at, uh, you can't see his tympana very well, but you can see the dorsal lateral ridges. So this is a green frog. Again, they come in various colors as well. Although I don't think they change colors, it just, uh, different varieties of the species. So for the sake of Dwight and other, other frogs and toads that we know and love, um, here are the things that we've talked about so far. And then one more thing, especially for frogs, is that they come out on wet nights, especially in the spring during mating season and if you slow down, you can possibly avoid them, maybe even get out of your car and, and, uh, and help them along. In the spring, there are a lot of uh, conservationists who actually go out with buckets and help them across. And in Germany and Europe, they, on the Audubon, they've built tunnels under the highways to help the uh, frogs and other amphibians get across uh, to their mating areas. Conserve water, which I have to say, we didn't do very well in our first years in at 65 State Street with all the new, new um, plantings. And of course, uh, reduce, reuse, recycle, avoid plastic, one of the main things for CPG to focus on and plant frog and insect friendly natives. On March 16th, we have an election in the um, village of Pittsford. So uh, vote green, uh, Rob Corby, is just absolutely astounding in the amount of knowledge that he has about uh, conservation, trees, preservation, uh, land and building architecture. So um, I don't know anything at all about the other candidate, but uh, whoever you vote for, vote green.
with many of you, I learned so much through this series, sustainable gardens, bird friendly backyards, pollinators and other insect habitats, and even more about preparing for backyard frogs. Many, 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 many thanks for this fabulous webinar, Megan, Mary, Color Pittsford Green leaders, Catherine Sinclair, Ellen Henry, and Jack and Jackie Ebner. I mean, Jackie Ebner. <laughs> and particularly library programming directors, Robin A Avery and Peggy O'Neill. Thank you so much. Learn even more about transferring, transforming your property into a beautiful haven for wildlife and joy by attending the, this, I do have the pointer now, this webinar on March 28th, um, when Patty Love will talk about uh, uh, permaculture. And if we all, and then in May, we have a planting. That's more limited. We can have up to 100 in, in March. And uh, she's wanting to limit it to uh, 10 or 15 really excited people in May. But if we all add our little ounces of strength to coloring our own communities green, we can be the happiest people alive. I mean, I think that Megan and, and Mary and everybody else uh, involved in, in greening and, uh, and working towards climate change are just happy people because otherwise, if you sit back and see what's happening in the world, it, it, you become totally hopeless and helpless. So uh, we can do it. When I was um, in medical school, I was a reformed smoker and I wanted to, to get a, some space in the hospital that, where there was no smoking because people smoked everywhere. We got one table in the, in the cafeteria, one, and the smoke just blew right by us to the door where we were sitting. So soon after that, you can't smoke in hospitals or bars or restaurants or on planes. And so I didn't do it but I added my little ounce of strength. So I really am a believer in uh, cooperation, co collaboration and doing something. Again, a frog house run on my personal income and some donations would love to have you participate. Buy, buying at our stores, coming to our events, donating money or time. Anyone who wants to help save the frog, the world, one frog at a time, whether independently or by our sides, is a friend of ours. Thank you for being you. Spring is coming. Come visit. Get your vaccinations. And as Seth, Seth Meyer says each evening, wash your hands, keep your distance, wear your masks, and stay safe. We love you. We did it. Thank you for smiling. <laughs> Robin, thank you for smiling. Peggy, thank you for smiling. Mary, I can't see you, Megan, but I think you're smiling. <laughs> you're a smiling person. Well, thank you. Oh, it was lovely. Thank you very much, Margo. That was wonderful. We do have a few questions in the chat, too, it looks like. And we do. Oh, it looks like, um, just also, to reiterate, the uh, if you would like one of the um, toxic free signs, oh, those right. are available on the steps of Town Hall mm -hmm. um, and at the Pittsford Community Garden at Thornell Farm Park. Great. Great. So I stopped my share now. Yes, go ahead. It is. Yeah. And then we have a question. I, uh, what is the name of Mary and Megan's Facebook page? So if we can just have that again. Mary and Megan. Oh, oh, I don't think I put it up there. Uh, but they can be found as, uh, as was mentioned on the new web, uh, Facebook page called uh, Mary, you'll need to help here. Healthy. Uh, yes, I, my, our, face, our new Facebook page um, is Healthy Yards yeah. for Penfield and Pittsford. Right. Okay. Yeah. Got that. Okay. Great. Um, okay. And then uh, next question here. What's the best material to make a frog pond, ceramic or plastic? <laughs> so glad you asked. Guess <laughs> what? 
<laughs> Robin, you answered that question. <laughs> Me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the expert, but I would guess um, maybe not either of those. It's, it's ceramic is okay. Ceramic? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But plastic is not okay. No, not plastic. <laughs> Unfortunately, I use too much of it and mm -hmm. it's ubiquitous. It's hard not to do. Mm -hmm. Do what I say, not what I do. <laughs> then we have a question. If frogs will likely, will likely, oops, I think I missed it here. Let's see. Or if frogs will likely outlive us, uh, and in parentheses statement early on, then why are we concerned about their survival? <laughs> <laughs> That's a terrific <laughs> question. Okay, first of all, um, I, I will answer let me answer that while it's in my head. Uh, we're concerned about their survival because if because we ourselves, humans, are killing them. And if we kill them, we will not survive. So um, I th that's it's really enlightened self-interest that we're concerned about their survival. But even if we don't survive ourselves, those little frogs are so clever that they're that they're going to be some form of them. And uh, some uh, Pearl asked uh, about the plastic. Why not plastic? I think she said. And mm -hmm. and um, uh, someone's there was an article in one of the science magazines that in the future uh, the, that the whole Earth will be covered with a film of plastic. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know all the the statistics or data for that, but uh, um, many of you may know that plastics that are thrown out. Uh, um, they, uh, I think that they leach into the ground and certainly when they wash into the waters, they're strangling all kinds of uh, marine animals and, and, um, uh, and even on the seashore where they are little, little creatures that run about to get, get uh, caught in them and, and uh, killed by them. So um, there's just no place to put all the, the plastics, China has uh, banned having any more plastics. Okay. Uh, so Lindsay just uh, tried to clarify uh, the question. So they're having a little conversation together, which I can't read all of. Yeah, the question from Pearl is, why, it, why is plastic better? You're saying why it's not better or something. I don't think, okay. Right. Yeah, it's okay, like that, yeah. out there. Anything else? Um, does anybody else have any other questions that they want to submit? Um, now's the time to ask if you have any. Right. Uh, this program is being recorded too, so I can't say exactly when it will be on the Penfield um, TV. Um, um, it'll probably be under um, on a YouTube, but we'll be you know letting people know. So that should be up um, probably within maybe a week or so. Um, it, we've we finished right on time, uh, but I see a lot of people in, that I know on the list, and I wish that you guys would speak up and say something, uh, mm -hmm. because uh, I'm sure you have some questions because of your prior involvement with me in the frog house. I see one other question here. What kind of native plants can we place in frog ponds? Okay, so uh, back to being ABD, uh, <laughs> both the uh, the librarians asked for a reference list one week before <laughs> this right. presentation. And uh, we got together a little presentation list yesterday, which I didn't have time to um, put together for this list. But if the librarians will allow me, I will put together that list. And I have a reference about plants that are better for frogs and, and uh, less good for frogs. If um, if the librarians will let me do that, they could send it out later. Yes, absolutely. We um, plan on sending an email out after this program. So okay. send that list over to me and I will include it. Okay, thank you. It may be, uh, I have patients tomorrow, so it may be Monday, but okay. thank you for being accommodating. Of course. Um, I answered that again. Please repeat the name of Mary and Megan's Facebook page. Healthy Yards for Penfield and Pittsburgh? That, that's correct, right? Okay. I just put that in the chat. Yeah. Okay, great. And then somebody else asked, um, where are the other three videos? So those will be 
well, two of them, the, the program last will, week. Yeah, we'll have those. Um, there was only one. The third um, session uh, last week was not um, uh, on video. So the other three will be in, um, it's penfieldtv.org. And I thought it was under community lectures, but it's in the, the videos. I, right, Megan? I think you, she's. I think yes. That's um, if you if you Google Penfield TV YouTube channel, YouTube. Um, it is um, under um, uh, lectures. Right. Um, they have like government. You know, they I think have it was community books. lectures. I think it was community lectures. Yeah. I'll include a link to the YouTube we'll page in, um, the email that I send out as well. Great. Yeah. You uh, saw a slide go by. Uh, quickly, and I went back to it. Came back a couple of times. It was a, a Walt Kelly uh, cartoon, and I'd like to make a, a comment about that. Um, it was the point that uh, that uh, the, the um, Miss Hepzibah, who was a skunk, uh, got a a little uh, frog in a Valentine, but it was, and she went arg. And the point of the slide was to say that not everybody loves frogs. Um, so part of what got me rattled was that just before uh, this program went on was that there was um, a comment that, uh, that one of those words, uh, rackety coon child, the word coon is used as a slur. Mm -hmm. This was referring to a raccoon. And unfortunately, animals are very maligned because people are called frogs and uh, and dogs and snakes and rats and everything else. And as I hope I made very, very clear, I don't believe in name calling of any kind. Mm -hmm. And um, so I certainly didn't mean by including that slide to offend anyone, but um, I even did a, a um, we made a big mistake and said, uh, Every gift matters, and uh, we got some heck for that because it was an, uh, taken as an insult and in, in, uh, to diminish another um, movement that uses that word. And so, um, I just hope everyone knows that I have a good heart and that I mean no harm. I try to do good, and I always stick my foot in my mouth no matter what mm -hmm. I do. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. We've gotten some wonderful comments, a uh, wonderful presentation. Yeah. Yes, this is so wonderful. So great to learn more about um, frogs and, and this valuable resource in our community. Okay, I guess everyone loves me enough to forgive all my stuff. <laughs> Trips. It's the ADD. <laughs> I have well, a new thank you. I don't think we missed any other questions. Did we, Robin? I think no, we, I don't see any more. Comments. I, think we, I think we're ready to wrap up for the evening. Right. Um, like I said, we will send out some resources after this program. Thank you, everybody who attended. Thank you, Margo and Thank Megan you. and Mary for Thank you very much work on this program. It's, it um, was fun. Yeah. Thank you. All Thank right. You. Well, I, forward, well and I just wanted to ask I you one thing about the chat, too. So before we close, so sure. All right. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much. Bye. -bye. Yeah. High four. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Can you do high four, Peggy? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I know. Can you. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>